Welcome to the Five Rivers Podcast. For more information, head to fiveriverschurch.com. We now join our services already in progress. Two weeks ago, uh, started this uh, two-part series on uh, CPR, how the, the nation and the situation, the condition our country's in, need the church's proper response Pastor Allen, former pastor here, last Sunday was the only Sunday that we could get him. Wow, it looks like, can you read that fast? Okay, message is over, let's go to the picnic, right? Wow. (laughs) Technology can be your best friend or sometimes your worst enemy when it wants to glitch. If we have to shut it down, that's fine. But let me give you just a quick recap since there was such a break from two weeks ago. And really, the R, two weeks ago, was more the church's proper recognition. Today might fall more on the response side. But two weeks ago was part one of today's part two message. We took a look at the concerning condition of our country, how the spiritual decline of our nation is alarming, isn't it? And from what we see going on uh, in the political arena to the devaluing of life in its most tender and vulnerable stage, to the agenda of attempting the redefining of what marriage is, to confusion about gender identity, and the list just seems to be going on and on these days. It is undeniable that the character and the culture of our country has shifted And it seems to be worsening every day. So we are stating the United States needs CPR, the church's proper recognition and the church's proper response. Two weeks ago, we looked at the parallels of where the United States is in our day and where Israel was in Isaiah's day. Isaiah was a, what's called a major prophet in Scripture, wrote a large portion or a larger book in the uh, Old Testament. So we see this parallel of where the United States is today and where Israel was in Isaiah's day, and that would have been about 2,000, over 2,700 years ago. He wrote about what was going on in Israel in Isaiah chapter 5. And we see his response to what's going on or was going on in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah recognized and he called out six areas of sin. Yeah, there you go. Just shut it down. Six areas of sin in Israel. And he pronounced a woe over each one of those. W-O-E, right? What is a woe? If you remember, a a woe means, in other words, damned or cursed or assigned to judgment. So in other words, because of this sin, woe is Israel or assigned to judgment is Israel. Give them to you again real real quick. What was the first one? Unabashed materialism. And in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8, he says this, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. You see, what is this? It's, it's selfishness and it's greed to acquire more and more and more, but with no desire to help others. The second thing that Isaiah recognized in Israel in his day that he pronounced a woe over was an unquenchable thirst for alcohol. He wrote in verse 11 of chapter 5, Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. Now today, this would be the the drinking and the drug scene crowd, you know, the sororities uh, and fraternities, etc., etc. So in, in chapter 5, verse 12, Isaiah writes about this crowd. Uh, they have wine at their feasts, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord. The third thing in his day that we see as a parallel in our day is unashamed sinfulness. So he writes in verse 18 of chapter 5, Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. 
In other words, see, these are the people who, who flaunt their sin. There's no shame in a sinful or immoral position, and not only blatantly prideful in their sin, um, but look at what he adds, or listen to what he adds in chapter 5, verse 19. To those who say, let God hurry. Let him hasten in his work so that we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view that we may know it. In other words, what he's saying is, hey God, if you want to do something about this mess in Israel and what the people are doing, well, come on down here and do something about it if you want to. That's, that's really what that means. So the fourth thing is, is exchange of values. So Isaiah writes in verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In other words, see, this is a complete reversal of the understanding of what is right and wrong and what is good and evil. The fifth parallel that we see in the United States today and Israel in Isaiah's day is unceasing pride. So he writes in verse 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. There has never been, and, and you know as well as I too, do, there's never been a more prideful or conceited generation in history than what we're seeing today around the world. The sixth thing is this, unjust courts. So he writes in verses 22 and 23, Woe to those who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. What he's doing is addressing, and we see this today, a legal system that is so convoluted, you have to question their ability to be able to discern right from wrong. Now, why did these things happen in Israel's day, and why, or Isaiah's day, and why are they happening today? Well, he addresses this in verse 24 of chapter 5. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty, and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Now, you know as well as I do, we are seeing these things and more in our day. And it was interesting, a couple of weeks ago, a number of you expressed to me after the service how you have also been feeling the burden of the day of what we see going on, and you were encouraged to hear it addressed from God's Word. And I loved what Jim Murphy had to say to me on the way out. He said, the enemy wants us to think he's winning, but he's not. Isn't that encouraging news? Yet yeah, the enemy does want want us to think, well, he's winning, that there's no hope for America or the world, but he's not, and we're going we're, we're gonna to be encouraged by that today. Hey, one more thing before we get back into the message. Can I take a commercial break? Is that, I forgot to mention this earlier. I'm a firm believer in VBS. My family came to Christ because of Vacation Bible School. I was going to mention that earlier. But all the way back, I'm not going to give you all the details now, and it wasn't with my parents, but it really started with a cousin and my grandparents. My, and I'm in the body of Christ today because of Vacation Bible School. So I believe in it, yeah. A transformed life because of Christ coming to our family, and it's trickled down to me, and, I, and now my family today is blessed, and I thank God for that. Okay, commercial's over. Let's get back to regularly scheduled programming, all right? So, yeah, we do feel the weight and the internal turmoil with a lot of things that we see going on today. And I believe Edmund Burke was right when he said this, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Burke also wrote, and of course you can tell this is a little older English, whilst men are linked together, they easily and speedily communicate the alarm of any evil design. They are enabled to fathom it with co co common counsel. And then he says this, and to oppose it with united strength. End quote. We live in a day where we can imagine and are seeing the end of the United States of America as it has been known up to this generation. Another parallel to keep in mind 
that I gave you from two weeks ago is a paragraph from historian Edward Gibbon's book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He says this in his book, five attributes marked Rome at its end. First, a mounting love of show and luxury. Second, a widening gap between the very rich and the very poor. Third, an obsession with sex. Fourth, freakishness in the arts masquerading as originality. And fifth, an increased desire to live off the state. We also see parallels today to what led to Nazi Germany. Martin Niemöller was a prominent Lutheran pastor in 1940s Germany. He was an outspoken public foe of Adolf Hitler and spent the last seven years of his life in uh, Nazi concentration camps. He is perhaps best remembered for his post-war words, First, they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. So why are we doing this series? Because we see and sense and know the trajectory that our country's on, and it is burdensome. It creates much internal turmoil. And I believe the church is, Jesus is the answer, but He works through the church. And that united, we could rise up together to make a difference. Listen, church, Isaiah watched his nation walk away from God and unravel. And now, as we focused on two weeks ago and just touched on today, what has happened, he is, he's now heard of God's judgment. But watch what Isaiah does. In essence, he ran upward, repented inward, and responded outward. What's the first thing he did? Isaiah, when he saw what was going on in Israel, he ran into the presence of God. Hear me today. He ran into the presence of God. In chapter 6, verse 1, I think we're fixed here. It says this, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, uh, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Now listen, these kind of experiences don't just happen. What did he do? Isaiah pursued God. Now, he didn't chase, notice what he did not do. He did not chase down the latest trend. He didn't chase down the latest event. He didn't go out and buy the latest book, self-help book. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not against events. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow for one. All right, and then when we get back next month, I'll be at a leadership event. I like events. They're helpful. I grow. I'm not against the latest book. My office is filled with books that's helped me develop personally and professionally over the years. So don't go out here and say, oh, you know, don't do any more events that are helpful. No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying there is no substitute for you and I pursuing God and getting yourself into the presence of God, just you and Him. All right, there is no replacement for that. There is no substitute for that. And that's what Isaiah did. He didn't chase down the latest trend here. He didn't uh, chase down the latest book. He got into the presence of God. Listen, his nation was drowning in a cesspool of godlessness, and Isaiah needed to be reminded of something. Isaiah needed to be reminded, in spite of all that was going on in the world around him, God was still on his throne. And that God was still reigning. And yes, God does in fact still rule in righteousness. Come on, I don't have to tell you. You know what's going on in the world. You see the news. You hear what's going on. Our nation is drowning in a cesspool of godlessness. And we need to get into God's presence and be reminded that God is still on His throne. And that God is still ruling in righteousness. And He's not been dethroned. He is, in fact, still reigning. You see, Isaiah positioned himself to see God. 
Maybe he had to put down his iPhone. All right, come on. I know he didn't have an iPhone. Here's the point. Maybe he had to set down some distractions and say, I'm going to set that aside. I need to get into God's presence. You see, Isaiah positioned himself to see God and what he was like. And he got to see that God was surrounded by by all of these incredible angelic beings. You know what he was doing there? He was getting his eyes off the problem and on the solution. You see, one of the songs that the church used to sing that I think is still a good practice for us today is turn your eyes upon Jesus and then the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. Because if, if all you get is the news feed, especially from today's media, you're going to be discouraged, burdened, and never find a release from the internal turmoil and tension. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Get yourself into the presence of God like Isaiah did. And then look what he was able to write in verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah 6. So he saw the, the Lord high and lifted up. So now above him, the Lord, stood the seraphim. Now, seraphim are these fiery, heavenly, angelic beings, okay? So, and, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their face. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of His glory. Now, isn't that an interesting contrast? He has to give these six woes because of what's going on on the earth. But now he's in the presence of God and he sees the whole earth is is full of the glory of God. What, What happened here is Isaiah got to listen in on the infinite proclamation of these angelic beings as they declared the attribute of God's holiness. Now, this is something we will never fully understand on this side of heaven. But the seraphim understand, right? The seraphim understand, and Isaiah got a glimpse. He got a glimpse of the holiness of God. He got a glimpse of the glory of God. You see, church, God is completely other. He is the only thing in all of creation not created. He's the creator. And what it does is it separates him from all else in essence. And holy is the only character of God in Scripture that is stated in repetition. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So when when we go to him, when you pursue God's presence... We should recognize God is still holy. I read in Scripture, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He's still holy. And even though He is our Father, He is so much more than just the best version of us. He is holy. It's what Jesus taught us to pray. In Matthew, when when His disciples said, how do we pray? What did He say? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. And he writes this in verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 6. At the sound of their voices, the seraphim, okay? At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, right? And the temple was filled with smoke. So God's holiness here is tangibly awesome. Have you ever been in the, in, in the presence of God in such a manner that, that there was this overwhelming, tangible awesomeness? If not, I want to encourage you to pursue that. And so in, in this moment, while Israel all around is disintegrating, in Isaiah's day, Isaiah is getting to see that God is absolutely everything good. And everything right. And he has remained the same with absolutely no change. 
and it's still the same today. Listen, God doesn't change his character. God doesn't change his word. God doesn't change his ways for each successive generation. There's a lot of change that's happened in the world. There's a lot of change that's happened in the church. But there is no change in the throne room of God. He is still holy. holy. He's still the Lord God Almighty. He's still absolute righteousness. And he is still absolutely other. And it would, we would serve ourselves to, well to think, well, God doesn't change his word for me because I have this desire and that desire or this and that and the other. Listen, don't look at the word of God through the lens of scripture. I mean through the lens of culture. Okay? Do not look at the word of God through the lens of culture. You need to be looking at culture through the lens of scripture. All right, it doesn't change. We need to settle this in our hearts, spirits, and understanding. All right, he was the same. And this was the proper perspective. And proper perspective begins, and the answer to all of our problems is recognized in his presence. So Isaiah ran to the presence of God. Look at the second thing he did. He repented before the Lord. In verse 5 of chapter 6, Isaiah writes, And I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see what's going on here? Isaiah is is in God's presence, and it's more than he can handle. And now, the outward woes that he had for Israel, we just recapped them. He pronounced six woes over Israel, but now he's in the presence of God, and the woes for Israel has turned inward, and he writes, woe is me. We would serve ourselves well, once again, to remember to, be, to truly be in the direct presence of God. It's a terrifying thing. Yes, He is our Father. Yes, He is our Savior. Yes, He is our friend. But once again, church, let us never forget, He is the Holy Lord God Almighty. We have to grasp this. So yes, on the one hand, close. On the other hand, unapproachable, except through Jesus. Isaiah stated he was ruined. And he was unclean among, amongst an unclean people. Listen, to be in the presence of God is to be made immediately aware of your own sinfulness. Isaiah, this great prophet of God, would have easily been considered among the best and most righteous men of his day, but one second in the presence of God, and he's ruined. He said so himself. Probably the most spiritual man in Israel, and one moment in the sight of God, and his own sinfulness, it overwhelms him. One moment in the presence of God, and and it has this purifying effect that calls us to repentance. If we are going to see a spiritual awakening in this land, it will come from nothing political, but it will be birthed out of repentance of the people of God. It will start in the church house. And hopefully make its way to the White House, not the other way around. Now look at verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and having in his hand a burning coal that he, that he had taken with tongs from the altar, he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. How many, how many are glad that with God there's always a way out and there's always good news? Amen? Yes. Because even though He's holy, yes, He's merciful as well. And equally so. 
Now, repentance, it's searching and it's painful. I love what Pastor John Lindell uh, wrote when he wrote uh, or said when he wrote this. There has to be repentance in our heart before we can start talking to others about their heart. It's a good word. You see, church, these are not days for our self-righteous promotion. If there was ever a time for God's people to be broken, if there was ever a time for God's people to be humble, if there was ever a time in United States history for the people of God to be repentant, it's now. Let us put away our shaking fingers and get ourselves into the presence of God. Otherwise, hear me, we can get it right on marriage. We can get it right on abortion. We can get it right on, a ge- on gender identity, but, but have a wrong approach and get it wrong in everything else. And then what good is it if we don't get all of our issues right and our attitude right and our spirit right and it never happens until we first go into the house of God or the presence of God and see God high and lifted up and it has, has a re- an effect on us like it did Isaiah and it draws us to repentance so that our hearts can be made right and we win the right to talk to others about the condition of their heart. When was the last time you were in God's presence and you repented simply because you were aware of your sinfulness and violation of God's holy standard? You see, it's only after we emerge from this brokenness, only after we emerge from this repentance do we have anything to say to the world around us. And yes, we have wonderful moments here corporately. But what really fuels that is when I do what, as an individual what Isaiah did as an individual. And when you do as an individual what Isaiah did as an individual, shut down the distractions to the best you can. Now, I know if you have small children, that can be difficult to do. But here's some things we can do. We, we can p- put the phone down, turn the computer off, turn the television off. Take a break from, uh, from all of the things that would distract us and say, God, I realize the condition of my country. I need to realize my condition. And I, ju- I want to get into your presence. Now, he, you don't see a lot of repeats in Scripture. You might or might not, probably won't see the seraphim and, and wings, and two covering eyes and two feet and flying around and, 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 and a cold touch to your lips. But I guarantee you, if you shut things down and you get into God's presence, He'll have something very special for you. Now, it'll draw you to repentance. You'll see your own sinfulness, but it'll have a purifying effect. So I want you to imagine with me if we all took messages like this to heart and, and in the days and weeks and months and the years that we have left together, if, if I section off a part of my day and week to say, God, I'm going to shut everything down. I'm going to get into your presence and I'm going to repent. I'm going to do what I need to do. And I do that and you 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 do that. And then eventually we all do that. Oh, my goodness. Imagine what a service would be like in here then. And I guarantee you, and imagine the impact we could start having for good in Elkton and surrounding area. I guarantee you, any church that really hears a word like this and and the individuals of that church make it up, we will become an unstoppable force for the glory of God in the land of the living. And we'll see God do amazing things in our midst. So what did he do? He ran into God's presence. And then he repented. Here's the third thing we see from Isaiah. He responds to God's calling. He writes about it in verse 8 of chapter 6. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Oh my. As much 
as has changed, much has not changed, God still sends his people out. God still sends his disciples out to proclaim the good news of his grace and truth. And oh, how our generation needs an adequate presentation of the gospel from a people who have come out of the presence of God. So Isaiah runs into the presence of God and and, and it convicts him of his sin. He's overwhelmed and, and then he repents and God puts out this question, well, now who can I send out there to help me out? And I, oh, oh, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. You know, Isaiah's like, I'll go over here, right? And I believe that God's still looking for those kind of people today that will run into his presence, repent, and when he says, hey, I want to do something about this situation. Who can I send? And you and me, we, oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Come on, who remembers on the, on the playground? field at school, right? Putting your hand up, you wanted the, the captains to pick you. Well, I guarantee you that in this, maybe you did or didn't get pack, picked at recess, okay, or when there was a neighborhood pickup game of whatever sport, but I guarantee you, you run into the presence of God, you repent, and God says, hey, I want to do something about something in your family, your life, your neighborhood, your community, and he says, uh, who can I send? And you raise your hand, he'll pick you. Isn't that good news? He'll pick you to do something about what's going on in the world today. Verse 9, and he said, go and say to this people. Now, here's where things get a little interesting in this passage. Go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And then interestingly, in that situation, God warns Isaiah that no one's really going to listen to you. Right? You ever felt that way? Tried to witness to someone, you, hey, you need the Lord, or God can do this if you'll just let him have, have some, some freedom in your life, some reign in your life, and they just don't want to listen, right? Come on, who knows somebody like that? Point at them if they're sitting next. No, don't do that. All right? All right. All husbands, well, I don't want to cause. I'm trying to help here. I'm not trying to create more problems, right? But it's interesting. What he's saying is, hey, I'm going to send you with this word. People are going to hear and not understand. They're going to see and not perceive. No one's going to listen. And Isaiah asks what any of us would ask in verse 11. Well, Lord, for, for how long? How long is this going to go on? But thanks be to God, in verse 13 in Isaiah chapter 6, we see there was going to be a remnant. Hear me today, beloved. God always has a remnant. And whether people listen to you or you're able to influence or persuade them in a better way in the ways of the Lord, He has you. You are a part of the remnant that God has on the earth and in this nation today. God always has a remnant, and if nothing else, they are a seed for what God can do. Look what God did in the life of Isaiah, and over 2,700 years later, we're still talking about it, right? That's an amazing seed. That's a seed that has, that has bore much fruit. God always has a remnant, and if nothing else, we can be a seed for what God can do. Now listen, I don't know what lies ahead for the United States. But I do know that the course that this nation is choosing, or many in this nation is choosing, it's an open invitation for God's judgment. And we see much behavior today as such as we saw in Isaiah's day, where in essence we're saying, come on God, come down here and do something about it if you want to. And hear me, no civilization has or can survive the things that we've embraced and, and we're enacting today in this land. Now I pray and I hope for a third great spiritual awakening in this nation. We've had two great ones. I hope and pray for a third one. But whether it comes or not, it does not change our responsibilities as believers. It does not change our responsibilities. So the word and the encouragement to us is to be a repentant people. To walk humbly in Christ-like humility. And share 
His grace and truth to our generation. At least leave a seed and be a part of the remnant that God can use to do something great. Oh, God, that He would send a great awakening across our land and reset and even exceed the spiritual highs of those that we've had in days gone by. Come on, you have loved ones. You would love to know they're going to make it to heaven because they've given their lives to Jesus and they've escaped the eternal flames of hell and and you love them. You care about family members and friends. Wouldn't you love to see those people a part of a wonderful end time harvest? And when I go to, and when I'm in India this time next month, one of the things that, just out of a conversation with John Hooper the other day, I've already added it to my notes, to, to sessions that I'm going to be ministering to pastors. God's called you to be a part of an end time harvest. And if you, are, if you are a believer today in the church of Jesus Christ and you're a part of the remnant today, God wants to call and use you and what we hope and pray will be an end time harvest here in the United States of America. Amen. Our nation needs CPR. You know that. I know that. CPR meaning our nation needs the church's proper response. The people of God rising up, not acclimating to the ways of the world, but raising the standard of God The world sees and knows and they have what they have in the world. And it's not bringing the hope that the heart longs for. But I believe if we run into the presence of God and we repent that we can respond to the world around us with a message of, yes, it's still truth, but it's also full of grace. God is holy, but He's also merciful. God's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. Amen? I don't know about you, but I'm going to, if you want to be a part of a church today, of a holy remnant of God in the land today that runs upward and repents inward so we can rightly respond outward, I'm going to ask you to stand with me today. I want to take a stand. I want to be someone that runs upward, repents inward, and responds outward. And be faithful. You never know. Maybe a hundred people won't listen to you, but one might listen to you. And you never know what that one's going to do. Listen, I told you, my family came to Christ because of VBS, really, if you trace it. You know, a lot of of people can say, well, I'm Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, even if they only go to church on, on Christmas and Easter. My family didn't even do that. And the long, do I have time to share this? Okay, we're good. Who wants to hear a good story? All right. Listen, I, my, my, my mother had a sister, just so broken, marriage broken, divorce, couldn't handle all of her children. One ended up with uh, one of my aunts, and another one ended up with us, and another with another aunt and uncle, and, and, and another with a grandchild. I mean, uh, with my grandparents. And the one, wouldn't you know, my, my grandparents got the tough one. Troubled kid. And a new, new Assembly of God pastor had come into town and just was working the neighborhood. And my grandparents wanted nothing to do with God. Nothing. Go away. Go to the house next door. Leave me alone. We're good. I'm telling you, we had no religious, no church affiliation in my family. None. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. You got it? <laughs> None. But VBS rolled around, and the pastor came, knocked on my grandparents' door again. Hey, I know your grandson's here. I tell you what, if you'll let him come to Bible school, we'll come and pick him up and then take him back home. Well, just like you saw today, why do you think we gave certificates out on Sunday and awards and beach balls? It got my grandparents in God's house. And they got saved, and my grandparent, my grandfather was radically saved. His life was transformed, like totally. So now he starts harassing his children, (laughs) which my mother was one of those children. 
And just like for so long they wanted nothing to do with God, neither did his children. But he knew God had saved him. His life had been changed. Right? So my cousin Mike wins an award, gets a certificate, but he had to come back on Sunday to get it. Got my grandparents in. They heard the good news of Jesus and got saved, radically transformed. And then my oldest aunt, who finally she gave in, came to Jesus. My mother finally started going to church. And now I'm being dragged to church against my will. (laughs) Right? Come on. Sunday morning. Come on. Who remembers? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every week. And now there were special services. It was a Friday night. Mom, it's Friday night. Don't want to go to church. Come on, we're going to church. You're having special services. August 11, 1979, Friday night, I heard Arthur Armstrong, old gray-haired guy, and all he did was just say, hey, Jesus loves you, but you have to accept that love. You've got you to ask him to forgive you of your sins. You've got to receive the gift that God has given. And oh, my goodness, I felt like the worst sinner in the world. I dragged my mother that night down to the altar to give my life to Jesus. And here... Two years later, here I am, <laughs> right? Still in, right? Yeah. God had a remnant in 1979. He's got a remnant in 2019. I know what's going on in the world, but I also know what God can do through us. We got to be a people. You want to come and play something? We're going to dismiss. I know we're going to go have fun a little bit. And, and this is not just a one-time response message. Really, we've got to get these kind of words in our heart and say, God, I'm going to run with this for the rest of my life. I'm going to run after your presence. I'm going to repent so I can rightly respond to those that you put in my life. You're welcome to come and pray if you want, but you're standing because you're saying I'm willing to be a remnant to meet the needs of the day. I'm willing to be a a part of the church's proper response to what's going on in the world around us today. Now I'm going to start praying and I want to encourage you two today, you to do the same today. Father, here we are in Jesus' name. Really true followers of Jesus Christ are a people of your presence. That's who we are. We're different we, your word says we're, we are a royal priesthood. We are a peculiar people. We're, we're to be a holy nation. And one of the things that makes us different more than anything else is that we're a people of your presence. And when we start getting weighed down with the stuff and the filth of this world, we run into your presence for a cleansing and to have a proper perspective recalibrated in us. And it starts with repentance. And Lord, right now, I pray that your presence would be here. And God, if there's, if there's anyone here today and the sin in their lives, and God, for the sin in my life, I want to repent. God, I've been sinful. And there are times that we need to feel what Isaiah felt and realize our sinfulness and say, Oh, God, woe is me. Help me. Cleanse me. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. If there's anyone here today that they're not familiar with your presence, they, I pray today they would receive the drawing into your presence to ask you to forgive them of their sins so that they could be made right with you like Isaiah was and, and like I was not only in 1979 but many times since I've had to run to your presence and repent and say, God, please forgive me. Please make me new. And God, we're standing today as a visible declaration. I want to be a part of the remnant of God. That you use, whether in the smallest of capacities or the largest capacities or anywhere in between, to be a part of the church's proper response, the CPR that this nation needs. Oh, God, I just feel in my heart to do this right now if if you need just if you're just aware of sinfulness and you need to repent and and um, make sure your life is right with God just raise your hand I want to pray with you right now I don't want to embarrass anyone but hey I've been there many times yeah God I, I just want my heart made right with you today I want to repent today yeah hands going up across this place Father you see every hand but more you see the heart what we're saying, Lord, is 
sin only sets us, it weighs us down and sets us aside. And, and we don't want that, God. You don't want that. So we've raised hands. We're confessing today. And we ask you to cleanse us with the blood of Jesus. Make us new. God, I know there's, there's power in purity. And the more right with you we are, the, the, the more successful and effective we can be in what you want to use us to be and do. Oh, God, once again, we want to be a people that run to your presence. Repent and respond. Run upward, repent inward, and respond outward. So, Lord, from this day forth, I pray that it would be a new day in the life of this church and the life that we can bring into the community around us. God, there are so many people that are so bound. They are lost and wandering aimlessly. God, there are so many people today that are hurting. They're broken. They don't know where to turn. But you have your church. You can raise up a remnant. God, you can divinely orchestrate a connection with those that are wandering aimlessly and hurting and, and are in desperate need of truth and repentance so they can be restored. Would you use this congregation and the life of this community to make a great impact in the days ahead? In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, would you take this word today? Please don't forget it. Don't forget. So by standing, you've made a declaration. Don't forget it. And in the days ahead, as you run to his presence and respond or repent inwardly, he'll use you in, in great ways. Amen? Stay and pray if you don't feel the Lord is finished with you yet. But as you feel released, as Brian sings something, you can make your way across and into the gym. I hear some of you are glad we moved inside today because of the, the temperatures. But listen, God bless you. The days ahead for this church, I believe God's going to use us to do great things. Amen? Have a great day. We'll enjoy some fun and fellowship here in a few minutes. If you've never visited us at Five Rivers, we want to invite you to this week's services with ministry for the entire family. For location information, visit us online at fiveriverschurch.com.